Welcome, everyone. I'd like to welcome you uh, to this second session of our Knowledge Forum series. I am Ted Christu, Associate Dean of Graduate Studies and Research in the Faculty of Education. Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. To acknowledge this traditional territory is to recognize its longer history, one predating the establishment of the earliest European colonies. It is also to acknowledge the territory's significance for the Indigenous peoples who lived and continue to live upon it. People whose practices and spiritualities were tied to the land and continue to develop in relationship to the territory and its inhabitants today. The Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the area's Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee roots. There's also a significant Métis community and there are first peoples from other nations across Turtle Island present today. Please, wherever you are this evening, take a moment to recognize whose land you are on. If you do not know offhand, I invite you to learn and to think about how knowledge of the land, its past and current inhabitants and any relevant treaties will enrich this space and support reconciliation. The Knowledge Forum Fall Series is exploring the theme of teaching during a pandemic, a subject that is sure to resonate with everyone in the education community at this time. Last week, we were able to um, hear Dr. Andrew Campbell present on fostering inclusivity and belonging in the online classroom. It was a fantastic discussion, and if you missed it, don't worry, we'll be posting it to our website soon. Today, faculty members Dr. Amanda Cooper and Dr. Christy Timmons are presenting on the research they have been doing on the effects of COVID-19 in elementary and secondary classrooms. The presentations will be followed by Q&A, where we will invite you to submit any questions you may have. To do so, you'll be using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please use that box instead of the chat. Please welcome Dr. Amanda Cooper and Dr. Christy Timmons. Great. Thank you, Ted. And thank you uh, to everyone for joining our talk and discussion today. Today, we'll be presenting our work entitled Understanding the Implementation and Impact of remote uh, teaching and learning in K to 12 contexts. So I'll begin by introducing myself and then I'll pass it over to my friend and colleague, Dr. Amanda Cooper to do the same. Um, so my name is Christy Timmons and I'm an assistant professor of early childhood education in the Faculty of Education at Queens. And I lead the ECE lab, which is a research team involving graduate students who are interested in improving understanding of the processes that influence learning, engagement, and self-regulation in the early years. And within this focus, we carry out research with children, with families, with early childhood educators, and pre and in-service teachers. And so our hope is to bridge research with practice by working as partners with those we seek to support. So early childhood educators, teachers, children, and families. Um, and so today I'll be sharing one line of my research, but I thought it might be helpful to frame my research in the three streams of work that I do. So we're, there are three streams of research um, that myself and my graduate students are involved in. The first looks at examining the influence and impact of educator expectations on children's learning in kindergarten. The second looks at improving understanding of self-regulation and self-regulated learning and assessment practices. And finally, the third stream of research, which is the research stream in which the work we are presenting today is situated, focuses on building educator and parent capacity to support learning in the early years. I'll pass it over to uh, Dr. Amanda Cooper to introduce herself. Uh, thank you, Dr. Timmons. I'm an associate prof of a professor of educational leadership and policy at Queen's University. And I'm really thrilled to be sharing this research, especially because um, I'm, I was originally a high school teacher and I think it's so vitally important to have the voices of teachers uh, and parents in, included in our discussions of, of teaching and learning all the time, but especially in times of crises that we're facing today. Uh, my program of research is called Ripple, Research Informing Policy, Practice and Leadership in Education. And it focuses on knowledge mobilization. Knowledge mobilization um, 
is a word about how we can better get research evidence used in policy and practice. Uh, where the rubber meets the road, it's where the research meets the road on the front lines of public service sectors. Um, it's also where research is taken up and debated and resisted. Uh, not all knowledge mobilization or research mobilization is good. Uh, evidence comes with political and uh, uh, in a political terrain, evidence use. Uh, so my area of research looks at four different dimensions, Ripple. Uh, basically, you looks at it in four contexts. The first is studies around research producers. So how do universities produce evidence? What kinds of evidence is being produced? Um, the second is the research using context. So these studies look at how policymakers take up evidence, what kinds of evidence they use, as well as how teachers and educational leaders in schools use evidence. Um, this is how they use data, data they're collecting locally, as well as how they use big R research as in journal articles. So both research and locally collected data. The third stream is around research brokering. So these organizations that are facilitating interactions between producers and users. And the final stream of research that Ripple focuses on is how can we tell if we're having an impact? If no one, if a research report falls in the forest and no one is there to read it, are we having an impact? So how do we go into complex systems and do large scale interventions and figure out how evidence, which is only one source of many important factors, uh, came to bear on the outcomes of that organization and, and of that, in this case, a K to 12 public, uh, public education system. Okay, so today we're gonna to take you through an overview of the study. Um, then Dr. Timmons is going to go over the early primary context that with uh, primary teachers that was done. I'm going to take you through the interviews with the high school teachers, and then we're gonna to try to leave enough time to welcome uh, questions and comments, which we hope you'll have. So an overview of the research. Everyone is, I'm sure, painfully aware that we are in the midst of a global crisis, a pandemic. Um, and so the overview of this research was to examine the implementation and impact of what happened right when the pandemic hit in March, uh, which was in Ontario was called the Learn at Home Initiative. Um, so how is remote teaching delivery happening at the primary level in secondary school contexts across Ontario? Um, participants included early primary educators, secondary teachers, and parents. Uh, I think we had a total of 40 some odd 44 teachers interviewed and uh, 11 parents about their experiences. Uh, we did semi-structured interviews and along the method side, we coded them in in vivo, we checked for reliability, we created a coding manual and all that methodological uh, stuff that makes it rigorous, makes our analysis rigorous, which I will not bore you with today, but please email me because I love talking about, you know, the boring underbelly of the methodological side. Um, but yeah, we were looking at how teachers especially, I think it's really important to say we were conducting this at the time. So these educators and these parents were actually living and teaching during the pandemic when we were actually conducting the interviews. So this wasn't them reflecting later, this was them in the midst of the chaos. Thank you, Amanda. So in terms of the questions that we were actually probing about, so we did a 45 minute semi-structured interview. And when we interviewed the educators, we were interested in the school and school board resources and supports that they were being provided with. Uh, we were also interested, of course, we were interested in learning if there was any learning gaps or challenges. And although we couldn't actually measure or assess those um, perspectives, we could capture that from the perspectives of educators. So we asked them about the impacts, both short term and long term, on students, on parents and on teachers. Um, we were interested in shifts with their planning, what their planning looked like now in comparison to what planning looked like previous to this move. Um, we wanted to know what teaching and learning looked like uh, for this dramatic shift. Uh, so we asked them to describe their weekly schedule, to describe some of the activities that they were, they were doing with their students, what assessment looked like in a remote emergency uh, context what they were planning for or thinking about in regards to transitions back to in-person learning, um, as well as recommendations, because we wanted to know what their perspectives were, what was working, um, but also if they had any recommendations that we could uh, include uh, that could improve the remote uh, instruction. When speaking with parents, uh, we were also interested in their perspective. So what did it look like for their child? So they would take us through um, a week plan of learning activities. 
Uh, they talked about how engaged or not engaged their child was in learning, what their perspectives were on impact, <clears throat> both uh, short term and long term. And I have its successes and challenges here. Of course, we don't always think about some successes or positive impacts of the of the pandemic, but we were interested if there were any of that, um, any of that was happening uh, when working with their with their children some supports that they needed in order to better support their children, uh, what their role was, some questions about parenting, um, and again, recommendations. We wanted to know what was working from the key stakeholders' perspectives and what still needed to happen. In regards to the early primary context, we can think about children and families and teachers in kindergarten, grade one and grade two. The purpose of the research in this context was to, one, capture the unique challenges and unanticipated successes associated with remote teaching and learning during a pandemic. So specifically to the kindergarten to grade two context where learning is play-based, is inquiry-based, what were some of those unique challenges, but what also worked when we moved learning online? And then we wanted to use those findings to provide recommendations for remote learning and strategies for supporting in-person learning in the COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So in terms of the participants in the K-2 context, there were 25 educators and 11 uh, parents. Uh, a thematic analysis was done and there were five emerging themes. So the first focused on equity considerations. The second focused on synchronous versus asynchronous teaching and learning, social and emotional impacts, academic impacts, and then the role of parents and parent involvement and the impact on families as well. And so although these are sort of displayed to you as if they're uh, distinctive themes, I want you to think that about some of the quotes that I'll be sharing with you today and realize that there's, there's really an overlap in, in these perspectives. So although I'm presenting equity as one theme, you'll see that it is included in the other themes that I'll be talking about uh, today. Overall, I would say that the perspectives captured within these five themes demonstrate that educators and parents rose to the challenge to support children's learning amidst uh, a global pandemic. So we'll start by sharing uh, some information <clears throat> about equity considerations. So in regard to equity considerations, uh, both the teacher group and the families reported uh, concerns with inequitable access to technology, uh, connectivity issues, and missing essential resources and materials in order to accomplish the learning goals as they were set out. And although a lack of technology was a key concern uh, for families where devices might be shared across several family members or they didn't have access to devices at all, a much larger concern was actually having the skills required to use the devices <clears throat> and the software in meaningful ways. So parents also discussed the extent to which they were able to support their children uh, with remote learning. And that was really dependent on the amount of time that they could allocate to working with their children, um, but also their knowledge of software and how to access the materials. And so oftentimes the strategy is let's give them tech, let's give them the device, give them access to the software. But that was really the bare min minimum. Even when that did occur in school boards, it was very challenging uh, for families to actually know what to do uh, with the software and the tech that they were being provided with. Um, overall, parents and teachers reported that transitioning to remote learning disadvantaged certain students and families and privileged others who would have had greater access to some of these resources and supports and who already had the knowledge uh, of how to, to use some of these platforms. So what you can see on your slide here is just a few of the voices um, of the educators and the parents. And so on the coming slides, when I share the different themes with you, you'll see that I always know which one is coming from a parent and the other ones are coming from uh, the teachers. And so I'll highlight just a few of them on this slide. Uh, so one teacher shared, a lot of my families, although the school board has given devices, a lot of them are still waiting or haven't accessed them yet. So I'm trying to make it as device free as possible. Another shared, it's made me think that maybe if I were to return to this role again, I'm thinking maybe a workshop for my English language learners, like their families on how to use technology. 
I know that sounds so simple, but so many of them don't know. They are not aware of certain things and to help them gain those skills, I think would be so beneficial. And a family, a parent sharing, if I wasn't, if I was working full time, I really don't know that I would be able to do it like this. I would either have had to take a leave of absence or I don't think that I would have been able to get done as much as I'm doing now. So that particular parent was actually on maternity leave and was able to spend a little bit more time than maybe some of the other family members were with their children. Um, participant discussions regarding equity concerns continued in their conversations about synchronous and asynchronous methods of instruction <laughs> and the findings revealed considerable disagreement, and you'll see that in some of the themes that I've highlighted here amongst within the group of parents and within the group of teachers in regard to both the benefits and challenges of synchronous and asynchronous learning. So in some school boards, there was the perspective that they were mandated to use one method over the other. So some teachers feeling like they weren't allowed necessarily to use synchronous aspects um, and others feeling like they should be and have to for a certain amount of time. Um, however, not all families agreed with synchronous learning and they reported concerns for equitable access that comes with this uh, delivery method. Um, many educators in the study opted for a blend if they were in a board that supported that, uh, doing a hybrid of both synchronous and asynchronous uh, teaching. So again, I'll just highlight some of the uh, the quotes from the voices of the, of the key stakeholders here, one parent sharing, Personally, I have an issue with uh, synchronous learning because I feel there's a big equity and access issue that comes with that. Another sharing, it would be so wonderful if even there were a Zoom meeting and the children could all see each other. My son would love that. So you see these contrasting perspectives in terms of what they're looking for in terms of learning. And then I'll just read one more, uh, one from the teacher. Uh, this teacher's talking about some of the social benefits. So, you know, the, I can see your house and look, there's your window. And, you know, it was just so cute. And they just clapped and clapped and I played, you know, half a song. And then they said, keep going, keep going. They just want that human connection. They just want to have fun with you and see you as a person. And if you can't rub their back and give them hugs, then you have to do it in whatever way you can. And last Friday, it was playing piano for them. And so that teacher really talking about the social benefits of seeing each other um, live during a synchronous aspect. And I won't read this last quote, um, but this is another teacher who talks about the more academic use um, of, of synchronous learning that you can use in terms of planning a 45 minute session, uh, live uh, session with 10 to 12 children and the needs for family members to be there to be muting and unmuting um, the, the cameras and the, and the mics of the children in kindergarten to grade two. In regard to uh, social and emotional impacts, we can already see these kind of uh, themes coming together in some ways, but educators and parents in this study described the degree to which their students or their children uh, missed their peers. And this was particularly uh, concerning uh, given the focus on social skills in the early primary grades. We know that kindergarten grade one and grade two are so foundational uh, for teaching those social skills. Um, and so educators really expressed some concerns uh, for some of the students who might have had more of um, a lack of social supports from their perspectives uh, at home. Uh, so just to share some of these voices again here, one parent stating, I think it would be really good for my child to still interact with their teachers and their peers. I think that's a piece that's really missing for him, uh, for them, for him specifically. Um, and a teacher sharing, they miss human interaction and seeing their friends and their teachers and building that community. And finally, another saying, socially though, for children that come to school for food, and for social interactions, this is another issue. We are more consistent parents for some children and therefore their experiences are drastically impacted. And this will have long-term implications socially and emotionally and academically. Um, without surprise, academic impacts are also something that were commonly mentioned uh, by both groups. Um, so in addition to social impacts, participants also discuss concern uh, for academic impacts for children. Uh, the families particularly expressed concerns that the quality of teaching had diminished 
Um, and one of the ways that the diminished quality actually manifested was through a lack of differentiated instruction. So lots of comments about um, it was a, just a very structured type of learning that was happening um, and it was standardized. And so there wasn't a lot of differentiation for students who might need that. Um, and educators similarly discuss the lack of differentiation or feeling of an ability to differentiate during uh, remote learning and contrasted this with the inquiry pedagogical approach that is really common in the early primary uh, grades. Um, and so although there was um, comments about uh, worries for academic learning, most of the parents weren't particularly concerned for their children, um, but they had concerns for other children or they could think about another ch uh, child in their, uh, uh, in, their, in their children's classroom that they were worried about academically in terms of having long-term lasting impacts. Um, so there's one quote here, I'm not going to spend too much time reading them all, but this one talks about um, not being very impressed with the quality of instruction here. Um, and then we have other parents who are okay, not so worried academically, as they feel like this will just be a little blip um, in, the, uh, in their child's academic uh, career. And then finally, in terms of the themes that emerged from this particular research in the K-2 context, was the focus on parents. And so if we think about remote teaching and learning, when we think about that for young uh, children, we can really visualize what, um, how much of a role the parents would need to have um, in supporting learning. Uh, so the educator participants in this study shared that parents were stressed and they were overwhelmed uh, with the time that was required of them to support uh, their children's learning. Uh, and similarly, parents themselves shared how the types of learning opportunities that were being offered in the early primary grades required an adult or a more expert peer to be there to actually support the child with gaining access to the materials in order to execute the task. Um, and so they reported being very uh, spread very thin and unable to meet uh, the needs of their careers, the needs of parenting uh, and teaching. Um, and so I'll share some of those uh, perspectives here. So one teacher shared, talking about the role of the parent, they are technical facilitators, workload organizers, and co-learners. They are adapters and cheerleaders and nurturers and emotional supporters of their children. They are play-based inquiry leaders. Another teacher sharing, well, let's face it, every parent is acting as an educator at home with their students because anytime their child literally can't do the work without assistance, whether that be to understand the instructions or whether that be to understand the lesson or anything else, parents are the ones who are doing the teaching. Um, and then we can see from the quotes here from the, the, the parents themselves, really worried about not doing enough uh, for their, their child and having a lot of challenges with meeting the needs of their careers, um, being parents, but also now <clears throat> being in the role of the teacher as well. And so I wanted to leave my time with you in terms of talking about the K-2 findings with some of the re recommendations. And so this research captured the voices of K-2 educators and, and parents as they really navigated uncharted territory and transitioned to remote teaching and learning. Um, and so building on these voices <clears throat> of the key stakeholders in this research, I offer here six recommendations. We have a larger seminar report where we have 10 recommendations, but I've tried to consolidate them for our time today. Um, so the first being um, having dedicated training and professional development for teachers and for parents on technology and software use. Um, <clears throat> and thinking about long-term, and this might be something that we have to go into the cycle with, there really is a need for these skills to be there. The second is a need for a more integrated approach. Um, and we've been calling for a more integrated approach to early childhood education for years and years and years, but we've definitely seen this in, in the context of the pandemic. And so this involves working with community partners, including childcare centers and medical professions, family support programs, food banks, libraries, um, and really to meet uh, the range of needs that families are experiencing. Um, we also encourage both a blend of synchronous and asynchronous teaching uh, methods while being flexible to the individual needs of families. And so there's some debates about which is the best method and which ones are the most equitable. Um, so considerations there absolutely are needed. More individual instruction is needed to support the lead learning needs of all students. 
Um, and this was shared from the parent and the educator perspectives. Policy initiatives need to be put in place now. So this recommendation was put that was shared in July. And so when I say now, I mean in July, we needed these policy, uh, policy initiatives to support educators as they're shifting um, online and that this is possible in the future as well. And then finally, equity, diversity, and inclusion considerations need to be the focus of all short and long-term um, decisions. Um, thank you. I'll hand it over now uh, to Dr. Amanda Cooper to share the findings from the secondary context. Thanks, Dr. Timmons. Um, the interesting part about this work is you'll see um, quite a few similarities across the themes, but also quite a few differences. So one of the things about the setting of the context in high schools is that high schools are obviously organized very differently than elementary schools. And this has a lot of important implications for how this rolled out in terms of implementation implementation. For instance, there's a departmental structure. There's diverse subject areas, math, English, French, gym, music. Um, you know, science class has labs. It's not on that list. I should have had that as a science teacher myself. Um, you know, shop, automotive shop and more. So um, of, the, of the teachers I was interviewing, they were across different disciplines. And I think their reaction to how it was going was also had to do with what was they figured was being lost or couldn't be done uh, outside of school. An automotive shop teacher, for instance, you know, you're not allowed to tell the student to go uh, do work on the car in the, in the driveway. There's, there's liability issues there. Also, a lot of the anecdotes, uh, a lot of the data seem to link to different levels of classes. Um, there was really different results if whether the students were in an academic class, an applied class, or a locally developed class. And there was also important differences among grade 9 and 10 students and um, grade 11 and 12 students that were more senior from the perspectives of the teachers. So mobility between four courses per day also posed different safety concerns and challenges with health protocols when teachers were thinking about going back in September. So I'm going to, I don't, we have so much data. I don't have enough time to tell you all about it. So I'm going to tell you four themes and it will, they'll be somewhat partial. The first I'm going to talk about is equity issues. The second I'm going to talk about is policy communication, um, which was handled very, very poorly. Um, the third is about implementation uh, by teachers, uh, technological capacity, but also pedagogical capacity, what their workload looked like. Uh, they had so many great ideas for how it could be done better from what they learned. And one of the things I think is really important as we go forward is capturing some of the positive things that came out around capacity building and some of the lessons learned because I think they're important to get those out there so that we can improve what's happening right now. We're, we're likely going to move to remote instruction again. A number of children across the province are in remote instruction. So if we can find ways to get these messages, these positive messages, these concrete tacit knowledge kind of things that these teachers learned and recommendations they made into the hands of educators dealing with it now, I think we'll, we'll, it, it will be an important contribution. Um, and lastly, we're gonna talk about student engagement. I mean, this is my favorite bullet point of the slide, teenagers sleep in, that, that ended up being a big problem for synchronous learning environments at the high school setting. I'll talk a little bit about assessment and socio-emotional needs there. So first, equity. I'm not going to talk about this, uh, the things that Dr. Timmons did. Obviously, there was an overwhelming consensus from every single educator. Equity was a primary concern for them. Um, access to internet, device, and printers. A lot of students actually needed paper copies of things and didn't have a printer. So what happened was... Uh, almost all the educators I talked to uh, were actually creating packages, learning packages that were actually print-based learning packages for students, especially those that didn't have devices or didn't want to work on devices for whatever reason, or those that even just wanted them in addition to devices. So there was health protocols put in place around how long the print materials would be there before they were picked up and all that kind of nitty gritty rolling out implementation around how to get devices to students, how many devices they could get. Um, and decisions were made about devices devices on data-based decision-making. So there was a lot of surveys sent out to parents. Do you have a device? Do you have access? What do you need? How can we help? Um, there's also differential levels of parental support possible. And this became really important in different levels of courses. So if someone was in a calculus class, they were, the student was saying, I need this calculus course. And unfortunately my parent isn't, isn't positioned enough to help me with this or to give me that specialized knowledge. Um, 
And then the equity issues, uh, one of the sample, well, I, I had a guidance counselor in the sample um, of teachers I interviewed. And that was a, I have to say, that was a very, very troubling interview. This was the first time I've interviewed uh, teachers and professionals for a long time. This was the first time I had more than one professional break down crying during the interview. Um, the guidance counselors were tracing what they thought were problematic. They, the students they were worried about from being in violent homes. And um, they could tell when they were trying to reach out and get in touch with these students that the students didn't even have a safe place to, to talk to them during lockdown. So there was a, there was a lot of, of concern about um, food insecurity, about um, risk of violence for students who find it safe to be at home. Um, and also there was students with exceptionalities dealt with uh, there's a lot of different stories around this, actually. Some uh, actually really thrive. There was mixed data from teachers where uh, some students with exceptionalities, it depends on the range of exceptionality, um, really didn't do well in the online learning environments, whereas others really excelled and surprised some of the teachers. One example I'll give for that is I had a, a teacher talking about autistic students really excelling with online environments. Uh, another example from another teacher was talking about their students that have social anxiety or get bullied all the time and how actually online was amazing for them. They were excelling and they weren't worried about the social anxiety piece. And so actually they were very, very surprised that some of the students that actually weren't doing well in the class were totally taking off and excelling with online learning environments. And I bring this up because I think it's so important in this time when we're assessing the contributions of online learning and the barriers and challenges that we don't generalize, right? I think that we need to look at what are the different groups of students this works for and why, and how can we differentiate among those students in order to build learning programs for them that 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 is that are productive. So the takeaway from this is that learning during COVID-19, it didn't create the equity issues. The equity issues were there, right? That's an important point, but it is exacerbating them. And participants talked about rather than a gap, now we have a chasm. And what are we going to do? These these gaps are widening and they're widening quickly. The Academic child at home with multiple devices with a parent helping along the way is continuing to excel in their learning. And over here, we have a student with parents who have lost work through the pandemic that's either going out to work themselves uh, with no access to device that's falling further and further behind. So part of the reason the gap is widening is if someone stops and someone keeps running, right? So there's some real issues going forward that we're gonna need to think about in the coming years. Policy communication. Well, wasn't this a mess? I'm just going to say it. All of my participants were annoyed. The, I call it policy by press conference. Our minister of education would announce things and things about like pretty hard policies. For instance, uh, marks cannot go down, right? In the high school context, that was a huge announcement. Um, policies around online delivery. Oh, Zoom can't be used. Oh, what? Everyone's already using Zoom. Now they have to move to D2L. Um, oh, you need to do synchronous learning. Well, they were already doing, some were doing synchronous, some were doing asynchronous. So the real issue with the ministry doing it policy by press conference, as I call it, is that educators and schools who are actually having to deal with messaging to both the teachers and the parents didn't have time to figure out the communication, didn't have time to figure out, weren't consulted about how it should roll out, how that would work. And this actually caused massive chaos within the system. Um, I mean, I love this quote. I definitely feel there's a huge gap between the ministry and board. I feel like we're always the last ones to the party. Everyone's trying to decipher the language, but they make an announcement and there's no plan. There's no follow-up. It's just a plan out, like words out the door, right? So there was a huge amount of issues, uh, communication and system alignment that could have been improved if even if, the, even if the ministry had been announcing it first to the boards, so the boards could prepare their communications for teachers and parents, and then communicating it um, to the public, that even a few days, a day, would have given them time to craft their messages because they would then be bombarded from parents with questions, and they wouldn't know. They were finding out at the exact same moment that the, the parents are finding out, often mediated through social media. Um, so there was a real feeling uh, around policy. Uh, teachers were pretty upset about that they were not consulted. They were on the front lines. Um, 
you know, it feels like the Ministry of Education, at least a minister, that they are the only ones who know best. And they're going to say and do whatever they feel like doing. And it's up to us to meet their expectations. So even with the latest announcement that suddenly we have to do synchronous learning, that blindsided a lot of people. A lot of people were in great rhythms with their teaching at that point. And a lot of students were very comfortable with the rhythm that they were in themselves. And now all of a sudden, you have teachers who are having to relearn how to distant learn, even though they've already learned how to do that once. So what happened as the, as the lockdown and pandemic continued was these the shifting of the goalposts, right? The goalposts kept shifting. So just when teachers were, they, they themselves often had children home in a pandemic trying to figure it out, um, these, these constant rapid changes are actually uh, continued to destabilize an already destabilized system, uh, which caused a lot of problems. So this is the key takeaway is that policy by press conference increased chaos and stress in an already challenging environment and that consulting with educators and informing educators and school board leaders first um, would have clarified communication infrastructure between the MOE uh, boards, schools and parents and improved the implementation of emergency remote teaching. Okay, so we need to really work on the system alignment here. It's important that we know how communication is happening between those levels and that it doesn't go to the public before it goes to educational leaders because it's the educational leaders and teachers that actually have to implement uh, these policies. Implementation by teachers. So first of all, I want to say this was one of the coolest parts of the interview for me. There was so much innovation going on. Teachers were trying, they were doing new videos and just-in-time teaching and amazing things to make sure their uh, students stayed engaged. Um, and there were successful teachers and then there were teachers that were struggling, right? So there was a wide variability about how this went. Um, and I think two major areas arose from this. The first was around technological capacity. Uh, Dr. Timmons spoke to this a little bit. If they were busy getting comfortable with the platforms and the videos and all the different tools, you can't really focus on the pedagogy yet. Having transitioned myself in the university setting, it's very different. You're not just sharing your slides. You've got 40 tiles of students. They're managing a chat box. It's not as simple as you think just, oh, share your screen, right? There's much more going on that can take away from the pedagogical focus. Um, also, if people, so if they were comfortable with the online platforms, and then if they had previous experience with online teaching, that's the foundation. That's the bare minimum, right? Those teachers kind of, you know, didn't miss a beat and we're right into it uh, without, without a lot of problems. Um, this allowed for pedagogical capacity, a focus on pedagogy. Pedagogy in online environments is different. And so some of the things that teachers told me was really important to them being successful and their students being successful were about student-centered and collaborative learning activities. It wasn't okay just to have everyone in a group, it, like together in one class. It wasn't okay just to have asynchronous. They needed to find ways to have students group and still work in small groups of students so that they could have those socio-emotional needs met and also be engaged. Another thing that was critically important to keeping momentum and learning, high quality learning happening was totally re-envisioning how assessment works, right? So the teachers that were excelling and was loving it were dealing with rapid and targeted assessment and formative feedback strategies. One example of many examples I have in the data set, um, a mathematics teacher would create this quiz and when they do multiple choice on the quiz, if they get it wrong, they'd have a just in time video pop up showing, no, this is how it works and this is how it's done. There was so much video going on for mathematics of working out problems and posting and these, these ideas for, because what happened really quickly was students that were struggling in a particular concept, um, they got shut, if they couldn't get the answer they needed right away, they shut down, right? And often they would drop off the radar. So it was really important. Teachers learned very quickly. They wanted to, one of the teachers said, I want to remove all the barriers to participation, right? So feedback when they were struggling was a barrier. Another barrier the teachers talked about, which seems so simple, which I was so surprised at, was the way in which all the links were going out to the students. So they've got four different credits going on, right? And they've got all these different tasks and links that teachers are posting in all sorts of different ways. And it all goes on out, let's say on Monday mornings. So all of a sudden this the student goes in, sometimes with the parent as well, and they see how many tasks, I don't even know for the week, all at once, all on Monday, hundreds of tasks 
discussion tasks. And it was too overwhelming. So once some schools figured this part out, that that was a huge barrier to access, they actually created a coordinated plan for not only to make sure when they rolled out one lesson or one day that everything was self-contained in one link, one PowerPoint, all the stuff was embedded. So it was in one place in a cohesive way, but also they coordinated across subjects and teachers. So that for instance, um, science rolled out Mondays, languages rolled out Tuesdays, uh, you know, music and art rolled out Wednesdays. And even this chunking of how the material rolled out, which seems really simple, was actually a huge barrier and caused a lot of confusion at the start. So these are the types of tips from teachers that I'm saying could be fed forward because when they're only rolling out their own subject matter in the high school, they might not realize how that looks on the user side of things. So thinking of that student experience on the other side is critically important to doing this well. So the takeaway is that teachers had widely variable experiences shifting to remote emergency teaching. Oh, they discussed an increase in workload and prep time. Many were talked about staying up into the wee hours of the night, especially because they were caring for their own children who also had no child, like no child care. So um, the, student, the teachers that were upset, I think that at the very start, there was still a lot of pressure from parents around the quality of delivery and all of those things as there should be. But I think in some cases, teachers felt like people were forgetting that they were humans in a pandemic as well with families of their own. It wasn't as simple as just get to work at this time. Um, so technological capacity is a necessary baseline, but it's not the most important thing, okay? The most important thing is now to focus on pedagogical strategies that work in online environments. And this includes different mechanisms for assessment. And that's what we need to focus on going forward if we're gonna make online learning environments, um, you know, if we're gonna optimize how, how they can be utilized and the learning that happens within them. Last but not least, student engagement. I mean, can you get these students up? Every teacher I talked to said they're, on, they're online during their work day, right? And all of the adolescents were not. Usually they'd start logging in at three or four, regardless of synchronous sessions. Their synchronous sessions were usually empty. Um, and they would, so students would start posting at like 3.30, 4, 5, and they would post till three in the morning. The students would, they could see when they're online. Um, so that was a huge issue. Another issue was, and this is one that parents, I didn't put my parent sample in, but I did interview a few parents. I only got two, two, two parents I interviewed. Um, their issue was that because it was lockdown, they were having a real, really hard time. The consequences they usually use with their adolescents were not working. So when the when the students wouldn't wake up or wouldn't do their work or wouldn't hand something in, they usually say, oh, you can't have the car. Oh, you can't see your friends. And guess what? They couldn't anyways. So as parents, they felt really powerless, a few I talked to, to actually be able to incentivize more engagement. It was widely variable across levels, usually by class. In academic classes, um, and teachers usually taught, I mean, each teacher that I talk to teaches at least three classes. So you can multiply that by the sample of almost 20 teachers. Academics had 80 to 90% engagement in most cases, whereas applied and locally developed ranged um, like usually about 20% to almost nothing. So people would have four out of 20 students show up, let's say, and some fell off the right radar uh, immediately. And everybody talked about the fact that they thought that the ministry announcement and I did not, they made this connection on their own, the teachers. They thought the ministry announcement about marks not being able to go down, which happened in March when the new semester started in February. So marks were already inflated in the senior years and the fact it couldn't go down, they thought that had a lot to do with turning off student engagement because students thought, well, I'm already getting a good mark. So they checked out, right? So that's another, this is another area where an unintended policy consequence uh, went through and teachers felt that it affected them. Assessment and just-in-time feedback, I already gave you one example is really important. Um, they had different understandings of engagement. Some students thought engagement was just handing in the assignments. Others thought it was showing up and actually in, like doing synchronous stuff or posting a lot on asynchronous boards. Um, so engagement, I said engagement dropped drastically after that announcement. Uh, and then the main concern of teachers around student engagement wasn't academic. When they were talking to their students and checking in and when they weren't online, they every teacher I talked to was calling, trying to get in touch with students to make sure they were okay. Their primary concern was actually their mental health because students were struggling big time, as were the teachers. So the key takeaway about this, where students engaged most when there was collaborative structures were put in place that allowed them to interact with their peers. And similarly, just-in-time feedback and formative assessment is absolutely essential to keeping student momentum going 
uh, when difficulties occur in online environments. And in the end, mental health and families actually took priority over academic outcomes, which I think is the way it should be. Teachers also said that they wanted the thing they missed most professionally around their development and implementation was actually collaborative spaces for teachers to plan and implement together. So key findings and recommendations, um, increasing equity gaps, uh, we need to actually look at that and target interventions. We need better policy communication. Uh, we need to improve capacity both on the technological side, but more importantly on the pedagogical side. And then for addressing student uh, engagement, we need more collaboration. And I know we're almost out of time, Ted, so we have one more thank you slide, I believe, and we're done. We want to acknowledge... Yeah, you can go forward, Christy. Yeah. We want to acknowledge our amazing team, uh, Dr. Heather Braun, Emma Bozak, Stephen McGregor, uh, Sophia Yankulov, and Braden uh, Cornfield. They were always instrumental to all the work that we do. And we also wanted to acknowledge the funding from Queen's to do this research, uh, Rapid Response uh, Grant, and also MyTex uh, research support. So thank you again to all the educators, especially out there, the teachers that were in the trenches doing this work at often great personal sacrifice to get this done for children around the province and for continuing um, to work in an incredibly challenging context. And that's a wrap. That is almost a wrap. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Christy. Thank you both. And so I'm seeing that there is a question and I'll give both you, Amanda and Christy, a second to just catch your breath. Um, while um, anyone who is here as a participant can please use the Q&A box. We have roughly 10 minutes left and I will um, proceed through them. So the first question is from Chris McQuaig. So thanks for this presentation. So many things to consider. I am wondering if the fact that throughout last year there was existing tension between the government and teacher federations came out in the discussions with teachers. If so, how did they think this impacted the overall program? It came out a lot and they talked a lot about that relationship and about um, the disrespect they were feeling. I could write a full paper just on that. I think the context of what had just come right before the pandemic um, was once again, not a good place to be when you need all people pulling together and working and working towards common goals. I think it was a huge, a huge issue. And I think the reason why we got participants so quickly is they were really, uh, they really wanted to share their voices and they felt that there wasn't the opportunity to do that in, in talking to the ministry and talking to the government and actually sh sharing what their, their own children and their own students needed at the time. And so that did definitely come out of the conversation as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you both. And so the second question here is from Sarah Karn, and it's, and it's a great example of how research begets research. And, and Christy and Amanda, the work you're doing is really cutting edge and timely. And so Sarah asks, um, I'm wondering if there have been any studies interviewing K-12 students themselves about their learning experiences during the pandemic. There actually have been studies. Uh, they weren't included in our sample, just the time frame, but um, it was suggested too that even when we were getting parents' experience of or teachers' experience of student learning, that that obviously uh, wasn't the best proxy. Um, so I think that going forward, uh, that's something we're talking about whether to redo some of these interviews for a longitudinal time point. And I think it's really, really important to get the student voices themselves as they were the ones who said the things about the links, for instance, right? That it needs to be, it's coming at us too fast. It needs to be chunked. And even though that was relayed by teachers, I think it's really critical that teachers could view it very differently than student, students do. And it would be important to get add that voice to the mix. Yeah, I think we're both very interested in that. In my context, being the kindergarten to grade two context, there's other challenges. I mean, one of my um, streams looks at actually capturing the voices of children themselves as part of the research process, but it's a lot more, a lot more challenging to do in a remote context without building, without being able to build that rapport um, with young children and how we capture their voices. But I think uh, Dr. Kubiner and I will continue to, to talk about this, especially that in that we might be moving to a remote context um, or continuing in a remote context longer than we necessarily want to. Great. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Amanda. Next question comes from Hillary Searman, who, hi Hillary, a Queen's Con Ed alumnus from 1998, working in the mental health sector. Hillary's question, so what is your sense of the level of mental health impacts expressed by the parents and teachers? 
Yeah, this was huge, I think, in both uh, Dr. Cooper's sample and my sample. Um, I um, I didn't share all the, the impacts in terms of social and emotional uh, today, but I can definitely say that there was a lot of conversations and one of the publications that will be coming out of this work actually talks about men mental health concerns for children who are three, four, five, six, and seven years old. Um, so we're thinking about really young children and the mental health impacts on them as well. Um, but some of the quotations I think shared uh, from the parents themselves and really feeling like they were not good enough um, and, and actually doing what they were, they feeling like they're not good enough in their, in their careers and their relationships or now um, as parents or as teachers of their children. So um, although we anticipated that would come out of the research, I think it was much uh, stronger of a theme um, than we had anticipated. I mean, as, as a parent of a, of a six-year-old, I, I think I made it two weeks and I'm a trained teacher. So it was, it was challenging. I wasn't, I wasn't part of the sample, but... Great, thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Christy. So, um, almost six more minutes, let's keep going. So from Susan, Susan Overwell, uh, Overveld, a comment to say thank you to you both, um, and that you're, uh, you were able to summarize your own experience with your research. From Tia Schmidt, here's a question about uh, the extent I think to which um, what you've looked at is a zero sum game between the private and public schools, but does private school play a part in taking resources away from the public school and furthering the divide between students that have access to paid education and those who are unable to have this access? Uh, I think it's beyond the scope of what this data said, but I think there's some um, in the, these times, there's some real, you know, schools need resources. And in this time, there's never been a clear divide, especially when health protocols, um, got put in. I don't know if anyone caught some of the Global Mail articles about private schools and what they were doing to deal with health protocols, installing touchless water fountains, uh, putting in sinks. I think during this time, once again, it's a time that's shining light on the inequities that already exist in the system, especially where resources are needed desperately. And what we know from the COVID data um, is that the COVID data maps for the province almost exactly onto socioeconomic areas, right? So if you look at the map in Toronto, rich areas, far lower um, COVID. So I think it's really, the, the question of public and private, I think really relates to resources, right? And how do we get the resources that are needed into the public system? Um, because there's a ton of innovation there and there's also obviously basic safety concerns that are happening right now in our, in our schools. Great, thank you. So the next two questions are again, related to the research itself. Um, and so Kadria Simons asks, what is the, what's next? <laughs> what will be the next steps in terms of future research in this area and teaching and learning? Dr. Timmons? Yeah, I can, I can start with that. I mean, uh, uh, Dr. Amanda Cooper and I this morning were talking about, can we interview, can we do a follow-up interview? I'm totally saying that, yeah. With educators because um, we want to know what it looks like in terms of that transition back. We tried to get at that in some of our questions uh, that we asked previously, but we would love to have more discussions with them. Um, what I'm particularly interested in as well is really getting these strategies out um, and hoping that we can support the educators and families knowing that this might be something that we have to continue doing uh, for some time and having some type of risk mitigation strategy in place to support families. Um, so we're not at that last minute uh, transitioning out of it. So in some ways, dissemination is a huge part of my uh, and, and your work, um, Dr. Cooper, right now, because we're hoping that this work can have an impact, but we would absolutely love to continue this research um, and have more discussions with teachers and right now. We, we've, out, of this, out of this research, actually, we did an environmental scan of all the risk mitigation strategies put in place in schools across Canada. And another thing we're playing around with, with some of the money left for the last month we have it, is actually having a student do an environmental scan of, um, of, of resources for educators and for parents. And so we're thinking of that as the ending point of this grant. And hopefully, so there, that won't be, the focus obviously won't be on publications. The focus will be on feeding those resources back into the system. Great, thank you both. And so um, our own Dr. Pamela Beach asking a question that you may have already started to touch on, but I'll read aloud. Will you have a chance to follow up with any of your participants, especially uh, those who teach remotely? 
We definitely want to, Dr. Beach, and we're looking for someone who deals with online platforms <laughs> such as yourself to join us in these efforts. I think teachers would want to talk again. Like I, I mean, when we put out the call for teachers, we had 20 participants within days, each of us. So teachers wanted to share their experiences, and I think they would want to again. And getting that time point, we didn't present today on what they thought would happen, what would be important transitioning back. Um, but having that data compared to what their experience has been in this, this fall, I think would be really instructive um, not only just for learning, but going forward, there's been a lot of talk of permanent online learning kind of schools and things like that, so that we actually capture what this grand experiment of uh, uh, remote learning looked like across our province. All right. Well, it's, it's uh, unfortunately time to end this session, and it's been wonderful. Thank you again to Amanda and Christy for sharing your research with us today. Everyone here, and, and please... Bring a friend if you'd like to. You're all welcome to join us again next week for a panel discussion featuring three of our Faculty of Education alumni, two teachers, as well as one administrator. Associate Dean Peter Chin will be moderating a discussion about their unique experiences during the pandemic. Registration for next week's session is open on Eventbrite and our website, educ.queensu.ca. And Dr. Christu, thanks for spearheading this. I think it's uh, these topics are really important and timely, and we really appreciate the organization um, that you and your office have done to, to bring us all together to discuss these issues. This is all a team effort, and, and I think this is, uh, as, as we come to the final 12 seconds, I, I'm almost germ, germ, very specific with my, with my <laughs> timeline today. Thank you to the whole team, and, and thank you, Thank you again, Christy, and thank you, Amanda, for showing how the research in our faculty is always related to the commitment to the public good. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and again, everyone have a lovely night, be safe and take care. Thank you very much.